to our November 9th meeting. And with that, I'd like to ask Mayor Bajowski and all of us to stand for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll do introductions at this time, and we will start with Mayor Bajowski. Julie Ward Bajowski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council, and here representing PSTA. Michael Smith, Vice Mayor of the City of Largo. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commissioner. Janet Long, Pinellas County Commissioner. Whit Blanton, Executive Director. Cookie Kennedy, Mayor of the City of Indian Rocks Beach, representing all the beach communities. Uh, Commissioner Cliff Mers, City of Safety Harbor, representing Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Tarpon Springs. Councilmember Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Petersburg. Patty Reed, the City of Pinellas Park. Bonnie Noble, City of Kennesaw City, representing the inland communities. Thank you. Tina, are there any citizens wishing to be heard? on any item not already on the agenda for action by the board today? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Okay. Uh, before we start recognitions, I'm gonna go up to the podium. So every day we should get up and have good things happen. And so today we're going to start with Jared, who, unbeknownst to all of us, got married a week ago. Jared, come up here. In a sandstorm in Las Vegas, am I correct? So we want to say congratulations from Ford Pinellas. You want to say anything about that, Dave? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it was absolutely wonderful experience um, throughout the entire time leading up to that day. A number of folks um, gave me their advice saying, you know, you can only plan for what you've planned up to this point, and there's going to be some things that go wrong that you can't account for. Just enjoy the moment. Uh, didn't anticipate a 60 mile per hour windstorm uh, in the middle of the desert, um, but nonetheless, um, when we finished our vows, that's when the sun peaked over the canyon, and uh, it was a really wonderful experience. So, um, thank it's you. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh my God, stay right here. Stay right here. Okay. So, I don't know. I guess marriage must be in the air because on the 12th, Christina is getting married, and I don't know if she's here today. Is she? Okay, Christina's not here. And Nusheen is getting married on the 13th, so come up here for a minute. <laughs> Nusheen, come over here. So, this is for you from, from Ford Pinellas. Congratulations. You want to say anything about your upcoming nep? Um, well, the storm is coming tomorrow, um, oh so Sunday should be looking really nice. I don't think we'll have a windstorm, uh, but same thing, Jared also imparted his words of wisdom getting married so recently, and uh, we're just really excited. I'm getting married in Dunedin. <laughs> um, and uh, No, our reception is at Bon Appetit. Um, yeah, and we're just getting married in a, a backyard in uh, my in-law's home, just a small wedding. Um, so we're super excited, and thank you all. Let me get a picture with oh. you, sir. Perfect. Okay, thank, thank you. you. 
So the other thing, we did this last year and I felt really good about it. Uh, it's Veterans Day coming up and we won't be here. And I always tell everybody that uh, my father, who passed away about two years ago, was very government involved, taught school for 30 years, re veteran. He was in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge, very big part of my life. He always said, never forget your veterans. So I know that we have a few veterans that work with us, so I'd like them to come up. And if there's anyone in the audience today that is a veteran, I'd like you to come up too. I was in the Air Force. Uh, I was in the Air Force for uh, 12 years. I started out as crew chief, and I went into computers and satellite communications. <laughs> I was in the Marine Corps Reserves and never got shot. I was in the Army for four years working in IT. All right. U.S. Navy and served in the Persian Gulf War as a cryptologist on aircraft carriers. Wait, do you want to come up now? Okay, come on, because we have other recognitions too. Okay, so first I would like to uh, recognize Mike, Mike Reardon, uh, who we just had up a second ago, so come back up here, Mike. <laughs> um, we uh, nominated Mike as a Vision Zero Hero uh, for the Gulf Coast Safe Street Summit, which we had last week in uh, Lakeland, and Mike came over for the ceremony, and all of the MPOs nominated uh, Vision Zero Hero as, as a citizen or an activist who made a difference on safety. And you've probably seen Mike over the last year or two. He has been a very strong proponent for the sidewalk project on Drew Street, as well as the Complete Streets project on Drew Street. And um, you, know, you need people like Mike uh, to really make a difference in transportation from the community. Um, we need to hear those voices, and he's done an outstanding job of, uh, of being a really great advocate and uh, probably annoyed a few people, but that's <laughs> kind of what you got to do sometimes to make a difference. So, Mike, congratulations. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Okay, uh, the next uh, announcement I want to uh, give is to Sandra Noble of our staff. Uh, Sandra, come on up. This is for 35 years as a Pinellas County employee. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Sandra has been a key part of the team here at the MPO for many, many years and uh, has worked really behind the scenes on a lot of data, uh, crash data analysis, supporting the School Tra Transportation Safety Committee, and just a wide variety of things involving mapping, data development, and we're really gonna miss you when you do retire. Uh, but thank you so much for all your service. And finally, uh, this afternoon, we have uh, recognition of Linda Fisher. Linda, if you'll come up. Uh, Linda has been with uh, the Pinellas Planning Council for 25 years, so this is her 25-year award. And <laughs> and 
I'll just say that um, you, you all probably know Linda. Uh, she is amazing. She is our land use specialist uh, for a variety of things, and she is a great resource to all the cities around Pinellas County and the county as well. And um, I don't know how we'd survive without Linda. She is just the, she does everything right the first time, and that's what I'm always so <laughs> impressed by. So. Thanks for your time this morning. I think it's important to recognize people like that, and Mayor, you do a great job of it. Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Do any board members wish to pull any items from the consent agenda at this time? Move approval. Second. Tina, did you get that? I have the motion by Commissioner Eggers and second by Long. Commissioner Long. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Motion carries, thank you. We'll go to uh, 6A, public hearing items, Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is the fall update, the transportation improvement program. We'll call up uh, Arianne, Arianne Martins, and um, you know every year we bring in the capital improvement programs from the local governments to add them to our TIP. It's uh, not a federal requirement of the MPO, but we like to have a one-stop uh, shop location for all of the transportation projects that are planned, not only in the next five years, but certainly the next year or two or three from the local governments. Arianne? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, um, Arianne Martins. Uh, for, per, for Pinellas, and I'll be presenting the follow-up date of the Transportation Improvement Program. So every year, for Pinellas is required by federal law to update the Transportation Improvement Program to receive state and federal funding for transportation projects. By November, we provide the follow-up date of the document to, uh, with the addition of county and local, work program, local government projects. What is included in a follow-up date of the TIP? Uh, local government pro work programs are included. The PSTA work program. The airport and seaport work program. Uh, this follow-up date, we, this fall, we have an update on the municipal airport as well as Port of St. Pete. But the main update of the document is the Pinellas County Capital Improvement Program. In the TIP, as well in your package, you can find maps and the corresponding summary tables. In the summary tables, you can find the project numbers, location, project description, as well as status of each of the projects in the county. You can also have an access to the interactive CIP where you can find the information and location all of all of the county projects. This dashboard is updated in real time and you can find it on our website and here's a page and a link where you can find this dashboard. Now we will discuss the project highlights of the CIP. For sidewalks and trails, the main highlights are Pinellas Trail North Gap between Tampa Road to East Lake Road. Uh, the design is currently underway. Uh, we're also, another highlight is the Pinellas Trail Loop, Duke Energy South Gap between Haines Bayshore to St. Martin Bridge. The design is underway and the construction is for 2024. Also, the River Road from Tampa Road to Nebraska Avenue is another highlight. The construction is predicted to 2024. This project uh, it, even though it's highlighted as a, it's mainly highlighted as a sidewalk project, it would also have a side path which, that has a RRFB on it. Oops. 
For sidewalk trails, uh, other highlights are the Men Baltra Road from Palm Avenue to the Pinellas Trail. The construction is predicted to fiscal year of 2023. Uh, Five, Project 5, Starkey Road, between Altman Road to East Bay Drive, is current under, under design and it has construction predicted to fiscal year of 2023. Uh, Project 6, MK Creek Greenwell Trail, the design is also underway. Project 7, Belcher Road Sidewalk Improvement from 38th Avenue North to 54th Avenue North, the design is also underway. This project in particular will tie into the City Trail Project. For bridge projects, the main highlights are the Beckett Bridge uh, is currently under design and construction is for fiscal year of 2024. Project 9, St. Martin Boulevard over Riviera Bay and is currently under design. For major transportation projects, uh, the first project is East Lake Road from Tampa Road to Trinity Boulevard. It's a roadway improvement pro project and it's under preliminary engineering. Projects, the second project is Starkey Road, Fummonville to Bryan Derry Road. It's a reconstruction and widening project and it's currently under design. Project number three is Starkwood Road from Bryan Derry Road to Oldman Road. It's a roadway improvement project and it's currently under design. Uh, project number four is Sunset Point Road and it's between Highland Avenue to Keene Road. And it's a roadway improvement project and it's under preliminary engineering. The fifth project is on 2nd Avenue. This is a complete street project. It's between 49th Street North to 34th Street North. It's a roadway improvement and it's currently under design. For Pinellas was awarded $1 million to fund this project. The sixth project is 54th Avenue North between 49th Street to 34th Street. And it's a roadway improvement and it's currently under design. The seventh pro project is the West Bay. It's between Bellary Bridge to Clearwater Largo Road. As also a complete streets <coughs> project, it's, under, it's currently under design. And this is one of the first projects that Fort Pinellas has taken over for complete streets and it's finally moving forward. For intersection improvement, uh, the main Highlight is Belcher Road at State Route Gulf to Bay Boulevard is a study and it's currently under preliminary design. For today's meeting, uh, if the follow-up date of the Transportation Improvement Program is accepted, the county uh, capital improvement project and the local work programs will be incorporated into the current TIP. I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding the TIP process. Any more in-depth uh, questions, there's the Pinellas County representatives are here, uh, Aaron Lonson and Joan Rice. So. Any questions from the board? Yeah. Commissioner? <clears throat> yeah, just to thank you for the presentation. Um, so the Sunset Point Road improvements, just real quickly from, I think you said Keene to Highland, uh, what is that going to? I know this is just a PE. Uh, what what are they looking at there? Do you know what, what that project is supposed to be? I think it might be good to have Joan. I'll have it to defer to, to the county. Or all these parents. Hi, I'm Erin Lawson with Public Works and Transportation Engineering. To answer your question about um, the Sunset Point project, uh, we're, we're mainly going to be looking at sidewalks there and just some, some enhancements to that roadway. Not widening? Correct. Okay. There's a lot of right-of-way there, but we're not widening. That's okay. correct. And, and then just one other question. Um, up on, it's just, a, a, I guess, what we use, um, part of the trail east of East Lake Road on Keystone been getting some phone calls about, um, I guess there's a discussion about putting rail, railing up there between the trail and the road. And two thoughts come to mind. One is, do we have something that looks better than those all god-awful guardrails? 
Um, and um, the other thing was is that the guardrails on Bel Air, that, that where the young man was killed, are like right on the road. And, and uh, that little area, is, there's not much room between there. Um, so it, it's just problematic. I mean, I'm not, you, know, you, you need to protect. Maybe the alternative is to slow traffic down a little bit instead of just putting up these guardrails that create problems, create sight line issues. And quite frankly, it is a uh, scenic corridor up there, at least the East Lake part is. So just a, just a question, comment um, on that. So well, I, I'll let county staff answer that, but I know we had a fatality there. There was a motorist that veered off the road and into the trail and killed two people about a year ago, if I remember right. Uh, it was really a tragic crash. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you can speak to the design considerations out there. Sure. On, on Keystone Road, we, we did do a design for guardrail along that segment of trail. So that, um, that design is complete. We, we had to avoid some utilities in that area, but it is now out for bid. So that will be traditional guardrail that is set on the side of the road um, between the trail and the road. And the two thoughts again, we have um, that silver color that we use on our, our, our lighting fixtures, our, the, uh, the red light, green light uh, mast arms, and we've changed those in some areas and upgraded the look so it has more of a bronze look and it looks it looks 100% better. So just just if there is an application, a paint application or something that would make that look a little better. And the second question is, as that guardrail gets to the roads, the intersection roads of neighborhoods, does that change? Does it, does it kind of cut? you know, curve down uh, so that we have that line of sight because that's one of the big concerns for people up there. So. Yes, and that is taken into consideration with the design. It doesn't, it doesn't dive down, but it does flare out a little bit, and so the, the line of sight is... Flare, like, away from the road? Correct. Like I said, opens the, the vista. Yes. And then to my first question, is there any kind of other application other than that galvanized silver ugliness that uh, that uh, is normal I I don't have an answer for that okay I do know I could bring that up to our maintenance division I, I'd um, like to just I just I yeah. that that okay. does become a maintenance issue with having any kind of coatings those are the prices we pay thank you appreciate it Michael a question to number seven on West Bay where does that stand as the design um, how far in and is there any impediments to that right now you want to speak to that, Erin? I, I know it's been in design for a little while. Yes, yes, we have started the design on that. We went through some preliminary engineering and the design is just getting underway. Um, I, I, I don't have the schedule off the top of my head just to tell you when that will be complete. With the uh, Starkey Road, am I correct that, will that have sidewalk on that, along that? Yes, okay. yes, right. definitely. There's, um, the, the sidewalk project is actually gonna be starting construction probably within the next month or two. Okay, all right, thank you. Mayor Pajowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, it, it's not on this list, but it just made me think because it was a county list. Do, we, do you have any kind of update on uh, the Dunedin Causeway Bridge? Yes, we are going through the RFP process right now um, in, in the middle of selecting a consultant and we'll start design on that uh, later this year. This fiscal year. On the design piece of it? Correct. Do we have... The bridges. Yeah, do we have any idea as to the, um, the time frame you're shooting for for construction, funding and construction? I, I want to say that is um, 2024, 2025, I, okay. in that time range. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, construction. Thank you. Anyone else? Tina, is, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak at this time on this item? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Okay. At this time, I'm looking for the board to uh, approve the fall update to the Transportation Improvement Program. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, this is a roll call vote, so Tina, would you take roll? Council Member Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Mers? Aye. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Council Member Reed? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. 
Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Council Member Driscoll? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. And Mayor Kennedy? Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Karen, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we're going to move into the Pine Ellis Planning Council. We will now uh, conduct, conduct it as follows. I will first ask board Pinella staff to present the item. Applicant local governments are available for questions as needed. I will then ask for proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents, and finally any other citizens who wish to comment or ask questions on the case. We will then hear a rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions and then we will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. This is item 6B1 and Nusheen will be presenting. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. I'm just waiting on the presentation to be popped up onto the screen. Thank you. For the record, Nusheen Rahman, planner at Ford Pinellas, and this first case is CW22-21, as Mayor Kennedy said, submitted by Pinellas County. And in this case, the county seeks to amend a property from the office and preservation categories to the employment and preservation categories. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow light manufacturing, assembling, assembly and processing uses, um, specifically for the mixing and packing of nail coloring products. The property is located at 10055 Seminole Boulevard and is approximately 13.1 acres in size. Currently, there is a 60,000 square foot office building on the property that you can see on that aerial in front of you, and surrounding uses include single family residential homes and retail commercial uses along Seminole Boulevard. Now, this is an image of the front of the subject property, which is that office building that exists um, on the amendment area. The rest of the area is preservation um, and kind of goes into the um, Seminole Lake area that you can see on the current countywide plan map um, in front of you. And that also shows the current category of office and preservation with um, water uh, along the amendment area as well that does not have any designation. And in front of you are just the permitted uses and density and intensity standards of the current category. Um, and because the applicant proposes to utilize this property for um, assembly and light manufacturing uses, that is not an allowable use under the office category. And hence, um, the proposed amendment is to the employment category. Um, so the area with um, the 60,000 square foot office building, that is the only part of the amendment area that will be going to employment, and the rest of the amendment area will be maintained um, under its preservation designation in order to conserve that land. Now, as you're aware, one of our countywide considerations is whether um, an amendment area is in the CHHA or the coastal high hazard area, and the vast majority of this amendment area is in that. However, the proposed amendment to the employment category will actually remove all allowable residential developmental potential from the amendment area, and there will be no impact to the CHHA as a result of this amendment. And to conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the employment and preservation categories. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the countywide consideration contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules, which are shown here in front of you. And lastly, there were no public comments for this case concluding this presentation. Thank you, Nusheen. Is there anyone on the board who has any questions at this time? Okay, hearing none, Tina, are there any proponents? opponents? Madam Chair, there are no proponents, opponents, opponents or other citizens opponents to be heard on this okay, item. Okay, good. Uh, looking for, I'm going to close the public hearing and I'm looking for a motion or move a Second. Okay. okay. I did not get those. I'm sorry, Mayor Kennedy. Okay. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to 6B2, and again, Nusheen. Thank you. Just waiting on that presentation to pop up again. This next case is CW22-22, submitted by the City of Safety Harbor. 
And in this case, the city is seeking to amend a property from the residential very low category to the residential low medium category. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the development of single family detached dwellings. The amendment area consists of two parcels located at 3404 and 3406 Enterprise Road and is approximately 3.6 acres in size. Um, the existing uses on the property include a greenhouse, a workshop, plant nursery, and a single family home. Um, this used to be a plant nursery business that is no longer operating and surrounding uses include single family residential homes. Um, these images show you the front of the subject property. Directly to the west of the property, you can see a rail line that is a CSX transportation rail line that is operated by Pinellas County. Um, and the east of the subject property shows you the very residential nature um, of this area. And the map in front of you shows the current countywide plan map category of residential very low, along with its permitted uses and density and intensity standards. And as mentioned, um, the intent is to develop single family detached dwellings on this property. Um, the density of that would be higher than is allowed under the residential very low category, hence the proposed amendment to residential low medium, the standards for which you can see in front of you here. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the residential low medium category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules, which are listed in front of you here. And there were also no public comments for this case, concluding the second presentation. Are there any questions? at this time for any of the board. Okay, hearing none, Tina, is there any proponents, opponents, or anyone else wishing to speak at this time? Madam Chair, I believe Todd Pressman is here for this case. Okay. And Mr. Pressman, you'll have three minutes. Todd Pressman, 200 2nd Avenue South, number 451 in St. Petersburg. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, board members. I think your staff has presented this very well, um, and uh, they found it very consistent on all standards. So we would ask your consideration and support. Obviously, this comes to you from the city with their support as well, and we appreciate their time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Any, any other questions? Before I close the public hearing, we'll close the public hearing and we are looking for a motion. Yes, sir. Pull up the images. Yeah, the property to the east, immediately to the east. Uh, there's a. They all look like single family homes located to the east there. Is there anything you're seeing that you had a particular question about? Uh, no, I guess uh, that's all. If it's if it's residential, it's all single family residential in the area. Um, unless Mar Marcy, did you want to come up and say anything? I'll pass it over to Marcy from the city. Good afternoon, Marcy Stenmark, Community Development Director for the City of Safety Harbor. Uh, there is a, a kennel, a dog kennel, to the east that's in unincorporated Pinellas County. Okay. So it's not residential right next door. So there's residential to the north and the east, but then right along Enterprise Road to the east, there is a dog kennel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, hearing none, close the public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to make a motion? Move approval. Second. You got that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Nusheen, one more time. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. This last one is CW 22-23, submitted by the City of Clearwater. And the city seeks to amend properties from the residential low-medium category to public semi-public. And the purpose of this amendment is to, is to provide expanded parking for the associated church and educational facility on the property. The property is located at 110 North McMillan Booth Road. Some of you may know this as the um, 
Calvary um, Church on McMillan Booth Road. It is approximately, the amendment area totals approximately 0 0.891 acres, um, but it is part of that larger property of the church, which is 41 acres in size. Um, existing uses on the property itself that are being amended include a single family home um, and vacant portions of the property. And surrounding uses include other single family residential homes and um, recreational and athletic facilities that are part of the church and the educational facility, um, which also fall under those institutional uses in the area. The amendment area, you can see here um, an image from Cleveland Street. Um, part of this area will become um, the intended parking for the church or the expanded parking for the church. Um, here is an image of the amendment area from McMillan Booth Road. And lastly, an image of the amendment area from Drew Street. So the expanded parking will be happening within the church property behind that building. The map in front of you shows the current countywide plan map category of residential low medium along with the permitted um, uses and density and intensity standards. So the L-shaped parcel that you see on there um, will, will remain open and undeveloped, um, but the parcels um, located, um, the Easter portion of the parcel will be used as a stormwater facility. Um, and again, this is all for the purpose of creating a more comprehensive parking plan um, for the church. Um, hence the proposed amendment to public semi-public, which will bring this entire area into consistency um, with the greater church use. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and consistent with the locational characteristics of the public semi-public category, and it can be concluded that this amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the rules, which are shown here in front of you. And there were no public comments for this case, wrapping up this presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nusheen. Are there any proponents, opponents, or anyone else wishing to be heard, Tina? No, Madam Chair, there's not, but I can hear you better now. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that was. I thought maybe I had my paper over thing, but it's, I guess it wasn't. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board after I close the public hearing? Hearing none, is there a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Nusheen. Okay. I think we go to presentations and or action items, and at this time it would be PSTA, and this will be Council Member Driscoll. Thank you. The PSTA board last met on October 26, 2022. Um, here are some of the highlights. Our CFO presented the interlocal funding agreement with Pinellas County on the Clearwater Transit Center. PSTA has developed a project budget of $44.5 million, including contingency for the design and construction of the Clearwater Transit Center. An estimated $10 million funding gap exists, and the county, recognizing the benefits of the Transit Center to the entire county, agreed to provide up to $10 million on any final funding gap. I repeat, any final funding gap. The PSTA board unanimously approved the agreement. We had um, a discussion and presentation from our state and federal lobbyists on our legislative priorities for the 2023 year um, based on the legislative committee's meeting. On the state level, the highlights include electric transit vehicle infrastructure, maintaining and enhancing our regional TD Tampa Bay program, allowing for flexibility in state transportation funding so that it can be used for transit and to allow pre-award authority for state grants. Then on the federal level, um, highlights of our priorities include the passage and signing of um, FY23 appropriations bills to secure funding for solar powered electric buses and facility charging infrastructure to ensure the highest possible FTA funding levels. Maintaining existing fair regional funding split for FY 2023 federal, federal funds and prioritizing funding from US DOT grants for a congressional directed spending request for battery storage and electric bus charging infrastructure. Also prioritizing LONO funding, bus and facility funding, ferry service capital investment, 
and other federal fan funding for transit. The next meeting of the Board of PSTA will be held on December 7th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Thank you. Yes. I would just like to add uh, to that report that um, PSTA's um, Heather Sobush and I are gonna be presenting together in a webinar on Monday uh, statewide uh, at the request of the Florida Department of Transportation on uh, best practices or at least a case study on MPO and transit agency coordination, particularly as it relates to the uh, transit agency's transit asset management plan and uh, public transportation safety management plan. Those are a uh, mouthful, but those are a couple of um, requirements that transit agencies have to fulfill, uh, and they are sort of internal documents to PSTA, uh, but we have had a pretty good partnership over the last several years where they support our performance metrics, and we support theirs, and we coordinate um, very frequently to talk about how we can help achieve each other's objectives. So I just wanted to highlight for the board that we are being recognized as a best practice in the state of Florida for that high level of coordination between our two agencies. And I think it's at least in part to the overlap that we have among our board members and PSTA's board members who can see a little bit of insight into how each agency operates and functions. But it's definitely um, uh, a rela uh, related to the staff and the staff's willingness to work together. Thank you. Commissioner Long, 7B, T. Barda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. The T. Barda board met in November and had a terrific presentation from the representative from CSX. That said, um, staff has continued with the request for, quali for qualifications, although T. Barda will now discontinue the procurement. It was suggested the MPOs carry the discussion forward. The U.S. Regional BRT, the work is complete on the U.S. 19 Regional BRT study. The designs and concepts of operation weren't as cost effective as hoped, so the team evaluated express bus service as an alternative. The executive team met October 6th to review the new analysis and was pleased with the results, which were presented to the T-BARTA board on October 21st. The project will now be transitioned to the MPOs and transit agencies. The gondola study was conducted uh, for the city of Clearwater and presented to the Clearwater City Council on October 6th, forward Pinellas on October 12th, and the T-BARTA board on October 21st. The Clearwater City Council will discuss the, in the coming months whether to advance a project or not, but the T-BARTA st staff had no recommendations or action for them to consider. The uh, I-275 Regional BRT, all of the environmental and cultural assessment work is complete, and T-BARTA submitted the document categorical exclusion worksheet and supported supporting materials to FTA on October 7th. Staff anticipates a report from FTA by year end. A final presentation to T. Barta's board is scheduled in November. T. Barta is becoming insolvent due to lack of state funds and withdrawal of contributions from member jurisdictions and will request the legislature repeal the agency. A plan to discontinue operations will be presented at the January board meeting. Commute Tampa Bay, the demand for the Van Pool program continues to grow, driven mostly by James Haley VA Medical Center and McDill Air Force Base. There were 194 Van Pools in October, October one more than the all-time high in September and 21% more than October 2021. And that is the end of the report. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Any questions for Commissioner Long? Hearing none, we will move on to 7C with the presentation by Jared Austin. I'm gonna turn it over to Witt. It's the adoption of the target employment and industrial land study update. Is there anything that you wanna say before he starts or? I think Jared will cover it. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jared Austin. Oop, I'm losing the mic. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Jared Austin, uh, Principal Planner with Ford Pinellas. And today I just wanted to walk through with you all uh, a brief update, overview, status um, of the ongoing target employment and industrial land study update. Before I do that, however, I do just want to set some context and give sort of a, a historical background as to how we've gotten to where we are today and why the report, a report such as this matters so much. Um, as I always say, Pinellas County is a redeveloping county, meaning we have very limited land for new development countywide. And those lands that we do set aside uh, for target employment purposes is critical for the continued economic vitality of the county. These lands over the years have come under great stress um, to convert to other uses, namely primarily within the residential and commercial sectors. And this is nothing new. This is something that was even identified back in the 2008 Teal study <clears throat> when a number of acres of land were converting back then. And what came out of that initial 2008 study was really the finding that we needed to continue to preserve um, land that was suitable for target employment purposes. Um, we adopted our target employment center overlays, which essentially take all that land that we had available and said, we're not going to let this land convert barring special circumstances. Um, and that was really the kind of modest operandi of the PPC moving forward. Um, the reality, though, of, of taking that sort of one-size-fits-all package um, when it comes to target employment lands doesn't account for sort of the on-the-ground um, employment characteristics of various areas throughout the county, such as the differences between a Tarpon Springs, a St. Pete, a Clearwater. And also, if you take a strictly acreage-based approach, um, it may look like Pinellas County has quite a bit of vacant land countywide, but when you actually delve down into kind of the nitty-gritty of those parcels, they're very small, they're fragmented, uh, and maybe not as suitable as was initially thought for target employment purposes. So how do we address a new strategy moving forward? The first is identifying these key industries that you see here. Um, these are industries that contribute to the gross regional product of Pinellas County in addition to paying higher than average wages. And in order for us to make room for these uh, employers uh, moving forward, we have to know sort of what are the real estate needs of them whether it be in, uh, inhabiting more class A office uh, type environments that can utilize a greater mix of uses and go more vertical in our urban settings as, composed, as compared to our industrial uh, manufacturing sector that needs larger spaces to make room for wet labs and hangers and a number of other types of uses. And what we've come to understand is that we really don't have a lot of space um, available to accommodate a lot of the more industrial manufacturing heavy side um, of our target employment clusters. And so we really need to be focusing more on a retainment, retention and improvement strategy for those. Uh, and we have a little bit more wiggle room as it relates to uh, the class A office space. Now in order to come to a lot of these determinizations, realizations and ultimately draft policy, there's been a number of factors that have gone into this work. A target industry analysis to identify what specific target industries we need to be focusing on a market analysis to understand what their needs are. We've done literal on the ground surveys of our target employers um, throughout the county to understand the challenges they face in terms of the employees they're looking to hire, their space needs and so on. We've supplemented that in addition um, with with one on one interviews with target employers who are here who have considered coming here. Uh, and we've even partnered with Pinellas County Economic Development um, and career source Pinellas to get some really great data to help supplement a lot of sort of what the, the market trends are currently. Um, we've done a number of GIS analysis to understand what land is suitable for target employers moving forward. And we've continued to engage stakeholders throughout this process through a number of roundtable discussions with affordable housing folks, planning and economic development professionals, our various community groups such as the Lelman CRA group, uh, the Warehouse Arts District and so on. And then we've obviously had a number of advisory committees that have helped steer this work, um, which make up representation from our elected officials, the private sector, uh, and many of those community groups that I had mentioned previously. And so all of that has really culminated into a series of draft policy recommendations. And now I'd like to give you kind of a high level overview uh, of what you might expect um, in the forthcoming Target Employment Industrial Land Study uh, report. No longer are we going to take a one-size-fits-all package to the target employment center lands that we have here currently in the county. 
We'd like to have a more nuanced approach that accounts for the various economic needs and sort of on the ground employment characteristics of our various communities throughout the county which do differ from one another. This has led to the categorizations that you see here on the screen, including target employment center local, suburban industrial, suburban office, and urban. And it's also included expanding our target employment centers to areas we were not previously considering that are suitable for our target employment purposes. Now in terms of how these actually take shape um, through the countywide plan, the target employment center local category was really developed to take into consideration much more of our smaller scale manufacturers and artists and users that do have those industrial and warehouse space needs, um, but maybe don't quite align with some of those target employment clusters I, I highlighted earlier. And so we want to allow these areas to flex and mix uses as long as it's done in conjunction with some sort of special area planning efforts, visioning studies that really help guide that economic de uh, development vision so that we're no longer allowing arbitrary parcels to convert or so that we don't allow arbitrary parcels to convert um, from employment to other uses that don't fit that broader economic vision. Prime example of what we've really tailored this for is areas like the Warehouse Arts District. Um, they are a community that has crafted a very distinct economic uh, vision for themselves, um, and we want to allow that to continue to flourish. Now, uh, other TEC locals may not want to take the more Warehouse Arts District approach. They may want to go more on that target employment side. We want to allow that as well. This is ultimately developed to give local, greater local control over how these areas set out on their economic vision. The next category is suburban industrial. This is more what we think of in terms of our traditional manufacturing and industrial uses. Um, these are really those areas that we want to have that greater focus on retainment, retention, and improvement. Um, these are areas that are not as suitable to flex uses. Um, and so we really are only looking to allow for those industrial employment uses um, in conjunction with perhaps some commercial uses as long as those target employment metrics are still preserved. Prime example of a suburban industrial area would be the Hercules Industrial Park in Clearwater. Another category, suburban office. This is more suited for those class A office users that are looking to be in a more horizontal campus style environment like you see here on the screen. Here we want to encourage a greater mix of uses including residential and commercial as long as the target employment uses continue to be preserved. A uh, prime example would be the Northern Gateway area um, in Bay Vista. And then lastly, our most sort of dense and intense um, target employment center category is that of our target employment center urban category. This is suited for target employers that want to be in an environment um, that has retail, commercial, residential, all within a walkable travel shed, um, and really in those more downtown cores. So a prime example would be downtown St. Petersburg, um, as well as downtown Clearwater. <coughs> Some other recommendations that will be included in this report. Better aligning our workforce development strategies with the target industries we've identified here. Continuing to monitor and understand in partnership with Pinellas County Economic Development and CareerSource where we are succeeding in terms of meeting um, the job skills uh, associated with these target industries and understand where we are also lagging so that we can better align our workforce with these target industries and continue to do a wonderful job of providing a job for each Pinellas County resident. Next is revisiting the housing compact work and doing a suitability analysis for housing just as we did for target employment lands. Just as we looked at uh, a number of factors to understand what lands were most suitable for target employment. We think we also need to do something similar for workforce housing uh, and affordable housing so that the two are no longer in conflict with one another. Some other recommendations will include small area planning for target employment centers just as we're moving away from having this one size fits all package where appropriate it may, necessary, it may be necessary um, to work with our local governments to address issues such as consolidated stormwater strategies, placemaking efforts, uh, providing additional incentives for infill and redevelopment, continuing to factor in the TEAL's findings uh, and report into our ongoing economic development visioning work, and incorporating regular updates of the data that was incorporated into this TEAL's update into our long-range transportation planning cycle uh, so that we can better uh, remain proactive on uh, the market side of things rather than reactive. Now, 
And as a part of this work, we've engaged a number of stakeholder groups, uh, a number of interested parties, um, and we have gone out and met with them um, and to, to show them these proposed recommendations to get their feedback. The Warehouse Arts District folks were very supportive, and in fact, if they had any complaint is that we couldn't make these happen even quicker. Um, in terms of our various local governments, we have met with all of the local governments um, in Pinellas County that will be affected, both their planning and economic development staff, uh, and they were very supportive of this effort. Um, the Lelman folks, the Lelman CRA folks, both business uh, owners and um, uh, the assistant to the county administrator has been involved in this work, and they're very excited about the TEC local category. Uh, and again, we intended to have um, many of our planning and economic development staff here today um, from around the county in conjunction with Pinellas County Economic Development to show their support for the adoption of a final TEALS report, um, which brings me to the elephant in the room, which is that at this time, unfortunately, we do not have that TEALS report. Um, it was fully our intent to have a final TEALS report here for you all today uh, to adopt at our November board meeting. Um, but unfortunately, um, given staff constraints um, at our, uh, with our consultant team, um, we unfortunately do not have that report. And rather than force a report to get to you all um, with very limited time uh, to weigh in on that, um, we didn't think that that was fair to you all. Uh, and that certainly the quality of work would not be reflective of all of the hard work that has gone into this um, up to this point. Uh, and so because of that, we want to deliver a quality final TEALS report. Um, and because of that, we'll be looking to move adoption of that final report to our January board. Now, if adopted, whether the report was adopted today or in January, those report findings give us as staff the ability to move forward and take those recommendations and incorporate them into the countywide plan to really develop that hard policy that'll take those recommendations you saw and incorporate them in the countywide plan. That time frame will now take between January and May to draft, and we would bring back those final um, countywide plan related updates in May of 2023, after which local governments would be able to begin updating their local comprehensive plans to factor in any of the TEALs um, recommendations that have adjusted the countywide plan in any way. So again, um, just want to reiterate um, our commitment to delivering a quality report. Uh, and while we don't have that um, here today, I do believe um, that when we do have that report, it will be reflective uh, of the hard work that's gone into this. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you all have at this time related to the report, status um, of the TEALS work, and so on. Are there any questions at this time for Jared? Commissioner Mertz. Commissioner Mertz, can you use your mic, please? Sorry about that. Thank you, Jared, for the presentation. Um, a little disappointed in the, the ability that the, in, the report uh, is not available for today as discussed, but I understand the, uh, the desire to present uh, a complete report when ready. I do have a question on the other recommendation slide that talked about workforce development strategy alignment with target industries. I have a number 24 on it. I'm not sure what that one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the slides are a little, yeah. yeah. The, uh, I like the inclusion of the red listings, which are the positions and right. challenging skill sets. Upon reading them, one kind of surprised me and I, I wanted to get maybe some further clarification or in light of the additional time that you have now, maybe they'll give you the opportunity to, to, mm -hmm. to get. But the last one under medical technologies indicated not competitive with surrounding metropolitan areas and it indicated Atlanta and Nashville and Charlotte. And considering the purpose of this is to, you know, look at reasons why. Right. Um, just the statement that it's non-competitive right. to me would be something that should be fleshed out a little bit. Certainly. You know, um, yeah. why? Because, you know, we've got some pretty impressive regional medical facilities here, right. whether it's, you know, USF Camels or mm -hmm. Moffitt Cancer Center, right. various places. So you, you would think that we would be on par. Mm -hmm. So if there are reasons for non-competitiveness especially if it's in skill sets or people or stuff like that. I think that would be a 
uh, an additional piece of information that would be useful for the region. Certainly, and I can follow up with our career source, um, Pinellas folks, as well as um, PCED and see if we can better elucidate a little bit about why that is the case. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Jared, I'm gonna jump on Commissioner Mertz. Uh, you know, there's several of us who won't be here who've been involved with this. Uh, when this comes about, you'll have a new board in May. Um, is May the, the very soonest and, and I understand that we want a complete com, uh, report, or is where are you where are you going with that? I mean, yeah. So the actual report itself, we're looking for January timeframe. That's going to be what really um, highlights those key recommendations and findings of the uh, that I've I've highlighted here. But the May timeframe is really for when we actually have updates to the countywide plan. So the report gives us the data, the recommendations. This is what you should do. We then, as staff, have to go actually find a way to implement those uh, as best as possible through the countywide plan. And so those updates will then come in that May timeframe. And that's really to align with a lot of the updates that our local governments are doing with their comprehensive plans so that we're kind of moving at the same time rather than they've updated their comprehensive plan and then they have to come back with these new recommendations. So that's sort of what's been the, the mindset there. Um, I'd like to make a special request that when that does come up that bon I know Bonnie and uh, Commissioner Mertz and myself, is there anyone else leaving besides the three of us? Is there someone, is everybody else still going to be on the board then? Just that we would be informed so that if we want to come to the meeting and uh, Commissioner Mertz, if you want to give any insight or look at it that yep. you can to the, the Ford Pinellas Agency at that time. Um, how do you feel about that? Sure. Okay. Um, that would be fine. Bonnie, just, uh, you okay with that too? Let us know. Okay, Thank so you. If, if you could just keep us informed Absolutely. and then, you know, we can come if we so desire. Yeah, and we'll ensure that that final report um, is still sent to the folks um, that you mentioned, and then that way, if there's still further information, feedback they'd like to provide um, about what they'd like to see in there, we can, we can capture that and make sure it's reflected in that document. Okay. Good comment. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Michael? Uh, Good pre presentation. Um, you said you met with all the uh, government entities, the cities and stuff. What was the biggest challenge they had or ideas that they thought could flush out a little bit more? Um, I don't know if they would say challenges, but they're just curious. I would say that the thing that they're probably most curious about is what are the specific incentives we're going to incorporate um, into these various TEC categories. So like. Um, what would be the new density and intensity standards that we would allow to try and get the growth that we're looking for, the development we're looking for in those areas, um, in the way that we, the report is sort of uh, pieced together. Um, that's about all um, I think we heard in terms of maybe some of the challenges or questions that they had. Obviously, um, the specific you know, sites or parcels, how those all get fleshed out and which ones get picked up in those new categories. We're going to be continuing to work with the locals on that. We've already informed them that it's not the last they've seen of us on the teal stuff. We will be back to meet with all of them when we have those tangible, hard policy um, recommendations for the countywide plan. So, yeah. I'd like to just add to that question. That's a good question, but I think more than just land use changes and, and policy. Yeah. Uh, the report identified that there are a number of these target employment centers that, that need some reinvestment yeah. and that they've, they've lagged in that investment. And a lot of that is infrastructure, some of it's stormwater, some of it's transportation, uh, roads and whatnot. So I think we need to really put our heads together with our local government partners about how do we incentivize or encourage capital improvement program projects like you just heard from Ariane earlier that are tied to some of these target employment centers, like the, um, the Hercules Industrial Park in Clearwater is one that, that certainly needs a little bit of investment. The one in Lillman is another one that has flooding problems. So that's gonna be another concerted effort of just ensuring that we're investing and reinvesting in the ones that are, that are most viable and that we really wanna preserve and protect and strengthen. Council Member Driscoll. Thank you. Um, well, starting with the, the slide that you have here, when analyzing the different target industries and like the opportunities and challenges, 
is that looking at these industry industries um, for our area as a whole or only as it applies to industrial land uses? Uh, it's specifically for these industries that are present within Pinellas County. Um, so I'll just say a number, so many of these industries, like uh, some of the business, financial services, IT, they don't necessarily have to be on industrial land. Right. They can be on commercial land, um, office, and okay. other uses. Yeah. Okay. Um, when when looking at the the challenges and opportunities and analyzing that for the medical technologies and life and marine sciences and when i when i think specifically about marine science for example um, we have a very strong marine science sector in st petersburg not in not on land that's considered industrial or or vacant certainly but you know the usf college of marine science you know, creates a very strong educational pipeline there. And then nearby, we have Eckerd College with one of the premier marine science programs in the country. So I would say that with that educational pipeline that we have and the fact that right outside the front door of the College of Marine Science are jobs um, that help us to retain that talent as well when they finish school and there's just so much great synergy that happens there that i'm i'm not sure when i look at the challenges i can understand um why that's not weighed in i mean yes it is uh, many of those jobs have higher than average educational requirements but we're positioned to make it easier because once you finish your, your um, um, bachelor's, when you have your, when, once you get your bachelor's degree, you can work in that field while you're going to school, you know, to get, um, to go further in your education. I mean, we have just this amazing network to help people get there where, yeah, maybe if you had to go um, out of this area in order to get that education and then come here to get the job. Yeah, it's a little bit harder, but I think we have just an amazing ecosystem for that particular industry. So I, I just wonder how much of that was really taken into consideration when it gets lumped in with medical and life medical tech and then life sciences as well. That kind of skews it differently. Right. Yeah, a um, couple things. Um, to that point, yes, I completely agree. Um, the reality is in having some of those broader clusters, um, when you have things such as med tech and a number of other professional scientific services that get factored in there, it could be something that's weighing it down that maybe the marine science is doing very well and some other sectors are, are maybe skewing that a little bit. Um, we can certainly continue to work to see what we can, we can pull out of that. Um, in terms of your other point um, about specifically industrial lands, um, one of the key things that's come out of this study, kind of an aha moment for our team, I know, um, is that you know even though the study says target employment industrial lands, a number of these target employers can inhab or can operate on lands that are not necessarily industrial land. Um, and we've tried to factor that in with our suitability analysis that we've ran. And so some of those areas that are being picked up um, for future target employment centers, um, such as the downtown areas that we have, whether it be St. Petersburg, Clearwater, including the activity center in, in St. Petersburg, um, as well as in the Clearwater countryside area. Um, these are all areas that popped up um, for, for potential future target employment. Um, and many of the lands that are there are not industrial lands, certainly. Um, uh, so we have considered that um, moving forward, and that's why we've kind of tried to capture those, those industries that want to be in that more Class A office, mixed-use environment. Mm -hmm. And in the case of marine science, they are actually looking for that deep water access right. and that waterfront um, environment because so much of it is around research. And the vessels that they have to conduct that research. Right. So it's just, it's interesting that that gets
pulled in with with all of, all of this other stuff when it's I mean it has it has its own needs and it has its own opportunities and they're not necessarily making things either so we wouldn't be looking for so much industrial land to grow that particular sector have you narrowed it down a bit to where you can see um, what 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 target industries actually need industrial land in order to grow and thrive here? Yeah, we have a number of the um, I'll go back actually. Um, so within each one of these clusters, um, so medtech, microelectronics, aviation, aerospace, defense. There's a number of target industries that fall under these kind of broad categories um, and associated NAICS codes with them, so we can isolate those specific industries. Um, but these are really the ones that um, primarily are looking for that industrial um, or headquarter flex space, just kind of given uh, some of the manufacturing needs they have. Again, like you're saying, there are some instances where there's outliers, like in some of the marine science field where it may not be necessarily industrial land. They need access to those waterfronts. Uh, but generally, these are the trends that we're seeing for these uh, target industry clusters. Okay. And then um, on the slide before this with the map, I don't know if, well, um, I think it's slide 15. This one? Yeah. Um, in in the southeast section of St. Petersburg, like we're like behind the word, the words St. Yeah. Petersburg, you've got two different colors there, and it looks like it's bordered with. Yeah, that just means it's proposed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a proposed uh, expansion of a target employment center. Okay, got it. So that that area right here, um, that does not currently exist as a target employment center but we would like to pick um, this area up. Now, the borders are general. We have to work with the city to okay. determine the specific <laughs> parcels. Yes. Um, this is just to kind of show a general idea of the areas we're looking at picking up. Okay. Yeah, I should Excellent. clarify that, yeah. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Brzezowski. Thank you. So, leaving that map up, um, You've got your more centralized areas now that you want to focus on for those industries. So the areas outside of those targeted areas that have industrial lands, what are you all going to make recommendations about that and what the different cities <coughs> should try to pursue doing with them? Or because it's sort it, there's a lot, you know, as you know, we have 24 cities. Um, there's a lot of that sporadic stuff around. And um, I think it would be helpful. I mean, I can think of my own city, but I think it would be helpful for any city that's got this group of a little bit of industrial areas to understand what what does the city, but not just the city, what does the county or the area, how should they be pursuing for what should be there? Because right now, we've all just had sort of this blanket, the county will never let us change industrial land, and so that's that. But now that this is going to come around and, and be changed, providing that it all gets accepted by the county, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll just say for my own city, it's the Coca-Cola property. Right, yeah. And, and a, a lot of the little properties around it are also labeled industrial. Um, and new ones have been built up in that area as well. So it's like, okay, well, how do we make an educated decision on what to try to pursue for that property, even though we don't own it? Sure. So um, I can just let you know that City of Dunedin has been very involved in this oh, process. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we have been in contact with Bob and George and a number of other folks over there um, to talk about many of the cha or the issues that you uh, raise, and so. As part of this work, we've done a number of suitability analyses, reports, market analysis to understand what are really the most viable areas in the county um, for target employment purposes that we should have a 
very specific set of guidelines towards what we allow to convert or be developed and so on. Previously, um, how it's been handled is that whether an industrial property is in a target employment center or if it's outside of the target employment center, we have basically the same approach, which is, is it meeting these core employment metrics, um, whatever proposed developments there, and if not, we recommend denial. Now the, the position moving forward is that we're really focusing on these key target employment centers. And so industrial properties that are outside of those target employment centers, that's really up to the local to determine um, what they would like the, the future of those sites to, to be. Um, and we will not be taking the same approach that we've had in the past. So is there, or will there be maybe at the county level, uh, again, amongst all the different um, organizations and government agencies that you're working with, will there be opportunity now that you've made these kinds of proposals slash decisions, recommendations, where there, will there also be the chance to look at these other properties that are not in these areas and assist whatever city it is, whether it's mine or somebody else, when they have a larger piece of property to, to understand what would be best suited for that area? Yeah, um, we always welcome more coordination. Um, and I know that that's something that Bob's brought up in terms of coordinating with Pinellas County Economic Development more to kind of make a deal happen um, for some of these sites that you've mentioned. And um, we certainly want to encourage that. And I think our team will put our heads together a little bit more about how we um, how we approach some of the lands you're talking about outside of the TEC. Yeah, and, I, and that's kind of why I bring it up because, well, you know, in the past and, and, and the problems we've had in the past, the, the same people aren't in those positions anymore. But, I mean, we've had a difficulty with with Pinellas County economic development in the past. There, that's not happening. But it would be great if there was sort of this, hey, particular city has this larger piece of land. I'm not talking about, you know, the corner lot, but a larger piece of land that could be good for something. Um, when those kinds of instances come up, we'll always pull together, OK, uh, Pinellas County economic development somebody from that, someone from forward Pinellas, someone from county planning or whatever it is, you know, the appropriate people that there's a group that will sit down and say, here's what we see, here's what we know our needs regionally are, we bring to the table as the city, whatever it is, what we know what our needs are. And then there's sort of a, a broad 360 view so you're not leaving, because I mean, we have a lot of small cities. You know, Clearwater, Largo, St. Pete, they have a lot more staff than the rest of us small cities to be looking at certain things. So especially for the smaller cities, Safety Harbor, you know, I can look at you and, you know, in some of the beach communities. You know, I think that sort of idea of a group, consulting group that will help you with that would be extremely beneficial now that you have all of this, but that it's not something we're trying to negotiate to get, that it's an automatic thing if you want it. Yeah, I think that's part of our um, Pinellas Planning Council mission and responsibilities is to be a technical resource and um, a source of convening the right people in the right room when those discussions are happening. And that's something we'll continue to do yeah. for sure. Thank you. This does give us a good framework for that. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Edwards, did you have a question? Because I know yeah, just a, a question or comment. Clark, um, uh, Mertz yeah, does too, Commissioner yeah, Mertz. Yeah, thank you for, um, for the presentation. This is uh, really important work, and I'm really glad that we're tackling it. And sorry for those that are leaving, that they're not going to be able to at least you know, participate in the approval process, but certainly we look forward to your comments mm -hmm. when, we, when we get there. But um, so one of the threats to the area was the, the legislation that took place in Tallahassee on, on the industrial license. Mm -hmm. So uh, the cities have, you know, marched forward in some cases because they can. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we work very closely with the city of St. Petersburg on a piece. How are the, how is, how are the rest of the cities kind of um, accepting our kind of discussion, uh, our proposal to right. kind of be careful? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so many of our locals have been waiting for this work um, for exactly that reason. They basically want sort of a key set of data and metrics they can point to to say why or why not they would support, like you said, maybe a residential or affordable housing project on an employment or industrial land. And providing them with the, the overview, like we've given you all today, with um, sort of the recommendations and findings, um, they believe that this is a really good resource to help allow them to kind of help determine which parcels they're willing to let go and, and not let go. Um, and that really kind of goes back to the mayor's earlier question about how do you approach industrial lands that are outside of these TECs, and um, that's kind of one of the potential solutions they're, they're looking for. Um, so uh, overall, they've been pretty supportive of this. Um, they do think it gives them the direction they need. Obviously, at the local level, they have to set their own um, guidelines for what they will allow um, if they are going to go um, the House Bill 1339 or Senate Bill 962 route. Um, and I know even with the case of St. Petersburg, there are some um, kind of guardrails put into that um, so that there are some um, employment metrics uh, still met uh, with some of those developments. So um, that's sort of the update I have for you on that at this time. All right. um, and so these, I, I guess, to, her, to, to the mayor's comment and to uh, the challenge for us is that we're basically um, telling them what we see, the study sees as why these pieces are important and uh, for the overall employment health, um, Business health of our of our of our county. I think it's going to be really really important that we also have thoughts put together on all other industrial because because there is a just a bunch of industrial out there that's right. not included in this mm -hmm. that that if we don't have if we have a well it's just not a target employment then it's going to go to the highest bidder and right now industrial you know residential multifamily. Yep. We're getting that kind of demand, not only from developers, but from the government sector sure. or multi, you know, housing and stuff. So I think we just need to have that, yep. that also available to these cities so that they, they go, oh, well, we don't want to jump on you know, this housing development, even though it looks nice because it really is, it's got some value. Right. So um, I, really, I really certainly hope we see that. I was looking at your map also. You have Tarpon Springs designated a, it looks like, TEC local? Correct, yes. So um, suburban industrial, there's stuff up there like that too. Um, so if we put this overarching countywide plan, would that eliminate the possibility of things that would be otherwise identified in suburban industrial? Uh, no, you actually raise a great, great question. So the TEC local category, even though I use the example of the Warehouse Arts District, this is really a category that allows the local governments to kind of shape how they want those areas to grow, develop, transform over time. Um, right now, Tarpon Springs <laughs> there has a lot of manufacturing uses, um, certainly there, um, that maybe didn't quite come up as suitable um, for our target employment uh, clusters. But the city of Tarpon Springs, at least to my knowledge, um, has the intention of continuing to go a more industrial manufacturing route with that area, and they're absolutely fine to do so. Um, if other uh, communities who have that TEC local category are looking to do the same, absolutely fine. Again, just trying to put more control in the locals' uh, uh, hands. With the areas like the Warehouse Arts District or something that wants to take advantage of the incorporation of a greater flex of uses that may better suit that area, um, we also want to allow for that, but that's where that kind of special area plan effort um, is going to be so critical so that, again, we have a, a document um, that the local is responsible for that we can tie back to and say, okay, we will allow this parcel to convert to some other use because it's connected to a broader economic vision for that area. And that Anklo Boulevard road that connects to those areas has certainly started to expand into some residential. Right. So the sooner we can kind of tell the story so that right. they kind of put a break on that, I think, um, I think the better. Um, in any event, um, you know, again, great work. Um, and look forward to the final recommendations.
Commissioner Mertz. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up. Very good discussion. Um, I'd like to also follow up on Council, Mem uh, Council Member Driscoll's comments. Uh, being an ocean engineer and, and being at the College of Marine Science for 25 years now, um, I want to make sure and, and leave with y'all, considering this is my last <laughs> uh, meeting, um, obviously maybe a perception of marine science is that it's focused in the water. Mm. But what's critically important is you know, immobilize in the water, right? Mm. But much of what you put on your ships and you put on various things is developed in industrial land, <clears throat> industrial businesses, in small businesses that do um, instrument development. And I can't tell you how many industrial parks I've been to over the years, going to various places and seeing various people work on optical systems or various kinds of systems. They're all in areas that potentially could deal with flex and could deal with, with uh, you know, um, machinery and machine shops. And to be able to, to take an architectural design and turn it into a product in what would be considered an industrial area and then sell that and provide that to researchers who then take it on the ships and do that kind of work. So there is a, a synergy there between not only just the ability to have access to the water, which is critical, but also have good access to the equipment itself, which then you take out with you and do your testing. It doesn't have to be on ships, of course. It can be in various applications, any of these water quality measurements devices that you use in the Everglades and various places, they're all developed off-site. You take it with you, you put it on, you, you make the measurements necessary to do the kind of work. So that interaction, I think, is, is important. And part of that discussion is in the skill sets, too, right, to, to know what it takes to be able to make one of those instruments, right? You'll need the structural design, the architecture, the electrical, all the components, the optical components. A lot of them that you have also listed under challenging skills positions under microelectronics and aviation aerospace also fit under this. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So th those aren't mutually exclusive. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Everything that you do in a good marine or life science application, even if it's in medical technologies too, the optical tele uh, microscopes you're using, all your high tech mass spec equipment is all requires microelectronic um, uh, skill set development. Very, very important. And the discussion that you had about um, the fact that there's, on all three of these, there's multiple items lumped together, right? You kind of lose. My, my first question dealt with the non-competitive mm -hmm. needs to be fleshed out a little bit better. But the top one indicates lower growth trends than other surrounding regions, which also kind of is a negative, has a negative connotation with right. it. Mm -hmm. And I guess in this case, I can take a little pride by <coughs> saying marine science is second to none mm -hmm. in, in the industry, right? So that isn't a lower growth trend, you know, that, but if you averaged it out with many things, it may be not mm -hmm. as high. Right. Mm -hmm. So, phraseology, perhaps. Of Absolutely. The first two, that first one and the last one, um, I think would be beneficial, and perhaps the incorporation of some of the challenging skills positions that you have in, in the microelectronics and aerospace mm -hmm. um, could also be pulled down to the bottom. Right. Because as an ocean engineer, my, my first job out of school was working in submarines. And everyone who's in submarines, there's very a lot of similarities between what people do in things underwater with aerospace as well. You know, you, you, there, there's a lot of similarities to that. So from an engineering standpoint, from a, a scientific standpoint, um, the challenging skills positions are very similar. Right. So um, just wanted to share that with everybody. Thank you. Anyone else like to say anything? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask if uh, we don't have to have anything else on this discussion. Okay. Okay, we're done. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know our team has a lot to work with, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to 7D, countywide trends and conditions. And Rob, 
Thank you for coming up. Rob Feigl, Ford Penance. I'm gonna present a brief summary and highlights of the Countywide Trends and Conditions Report. This is published annually, but it has more, uh, uh, we have a lot of reports that we have published throughout the year that have a lot more detail than this one. This report is sort of a high level snapshot of the big picture of things, both geographically in, the terms, of, in terms of it being countywide, and also time-wise with regard to it being a five-year trend with a lot of the statistics. The report's updated annually and is a, a snapshot of uh, a lot of the key trends such as traffic congestion, infrastructure, crash data, but also takes into consideration land use, employment, tourism, and emerging technologies. With regard to congestion, we definitely have more congestion during tourist season and, uh, and during uh, times when, we, when the weather gets nicer. We have a lot of more of the, the seasonal residents coming down. Uh, but we'd have less of that congestion if we had more people utilizing other means of, of uh, transportation, rather, uh, such as working from home. And uh, with 54% of the residents living less than 10 miles from the workplace, that being up 1% from last year, uh, bicycling or even walking to work is an option for more than half of our residents. And Pinellas County has continued to do a great job of providing infrastructure with 84 uh, percent, that being up from 80 percent last year on the uh, Pinellas Trail route loop and also having numerous other trails, 78 miles of other trails uh, throughout the county. So today more than 35 percent of the jobs uh, are within a half a mile of a trail making it easier and safer to bike or walk as an alternative to using a single occupancy vehicle. This is a positive trend that indicates more households have access to multimodal options, including biking and walking. More residents than ever are working from home. The most recent 2021 census data estimate, estimate is that uh, the percentage of Pinellas County residents working from home has now increased to an, an unprecedented 21%. Prior to the pandemic, that was only 7%, and that's consistent with the nationwide trends, it's only slightly higher than the, the nation, nation's uh, trends as a whole. Working from home trends are also at least in part contributing to another trend, which has been a decrease in traffic counts for monitored roadways. Even if you completely disregard 2020 as an outlier due to the pandemic, the overall trend for the average annual daily counts has been a steady decline between 27 and 2021. And an emerging trend since the pandemic started has been that with fewer cars on the roads, although it initially led to fewer crashes and fatalities in 2020, we saw increases in the number of vulnerable uh, road users uh, fatalities in 2021, and speed appears to be playing a role in that. During the pandemic, and even now with more people working at home, the, the people have become more accustomed to driving faster on slightly less congested roads. Data from law enforcement indicates that fewer cars on the roads resulted in higher speeds and significant increases in law enforcement issuing speeding citations. So as you can see on the slide, we know that greater speed results in higher likelihood of crashes resulting in fatalities. And as congestion increased, people continue to drive fast on the more congested roads in 2021. Uh, although on average, the total number of crashes have decreased 2.5% and injuries are down 8%. The number of fatalities have increased over the five-year average between 2017 and 2021. Most traffic fatalities involve our vulnerable road users. That inclu includes our motorcyclists, uh, bicyclists, and pedestrians. And crash fatalities have increased uh, significantly for, uh, for bicyclists. The number of crash fatalities for bicyclists is up 53% uh, because the average has increased uh, from six to nine per year, and a lower number of fatalities affects that percentage more. Usual suspects are involved with regard to fatal crashes with impairment, aggressive driving, and, and agent, 
aging drivers, uh, making up one out of every three fatal crashes. And those uh, fatal crashes are up across the board on average. It's not all bad news, however, with regard to the, the, the crashes. More recently, taking into consideration the, the fact that this report's really only covering 2017 to 2021, a five-year average. Uh, what about 2022 so far? So when we took this to our committees uh, last month, uh, just as you have in your, uh, in your agenda under informational items, a fatalities map, we have that with our committees as well, and we track the fatal crashes uh, monthly. So we took a look at that to, to just see how we're doing so far. And this is the slide that we took to the committees. We only had up to September at that point. So the good news is that uh, with regard not to the five-year trend, but to most recent trend, the most recent numbers that we have, across the board, everything is down in double digits with the exception of motorcyclists, which is up uh, 23%. Uh, since this went to committees, however, we've got the, the map that is now included in, your, uh, in the back of your packet, so we can now include the, uh, the October statistics. So I updated that for this meeting, and happy to report so far the crashes are down even more uh, <coughs> compared to this time last year, uh, with, with the exception of a motorcyclist, which is up 4%, which is, which is still better than last month, which is, 20, which is 23%. Um, as always, more, more detailed crash information is available year-round to all our local governments via our crash data uh, management system. Uh, Ford Pinellas integrates safety in all aspects of the planning process. The Complete Streets Program, Transportation Alternatives Program, to name a few, as well as Safe Streets uh, Pinellas Initiative. Although Ford Pinellas is more of a monitoring agency than implementing we do work with and depend heavily on our numerous partner agencies to integrate safety into projects, basically at every level from, from the project development and environment, design, construction, and even after construction. As you know, this board adopted the Safe Streets Pinellas Action Plan in March of 2021. And uh, the resolution has since been adopted by every local government in, in Pinellas County, uh, with only a few who have not yet uh, adopted the resolution. And I'm proud to say that Ford Pinellas staff has worked really hard together to, uh, to develop this, this update and, and document and uh, update this document internally uh, as we found time to do so. And I'd like to especially thank uh, Sandra Noble and Linda Fisher of our staff who were both recognized earlier at the beginning of the meeting for their help and uh, among others in, in uh, updating this report. And so without having to take any questions. Any questions at this time? Thank you very much, Rob. Yes, yes. Uh, so he asked about 27,000 crashes. Yeah, that's in the five-year period, right? That's over the uh, five-year average. That's on average how many crashes there are over the five-year average, 2017 to 2021. 20, uh, those, that's, that's annual, though, right? So 27,000 yes. annually? Yes, sir, on, on average. It's the right. average annual. Okay, average annual. And, um, and do you have that information by road use category? You yeah, have percentages uh, here. I was just wondering if you had actual numbers. I don't mean right now. We do. We have it's broken down the report by year. Okay. Uh, so you can compare any two two points of time in year. So which is kind of what I did toward the toward the very end. I wasn't doing the five year average at the very end. I was just comparing uh, the most recent data we had from uh, okay. 2021 to to 2022. But on this page 10, for instance, you could give us instead of the the, two, the down two per. 2.5. You could give us the number of crashes per category. Um, absolutely, we can, yeah. we can do that. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. We, we can Rob, follow up with that information. Rob, I want to just piggyback um, Commissioner Edgar. So when you're saying 27 plus crashes, that in, that's including fender benders, you know, things like that. That's everything. That's all, all crashes. Okay. It's okay. all reported crashes. Reported crashes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was asking. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else at this time? Oh, Tina, is there anyone who'd like to speak at this time? 
No, Madam Chair, there is not. Okay, I'm looking for a motion. Move approval. Second. Okay. That's a pretty small number. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, motion carries. Thank you, Rob. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Witt, and we're gonna talk about 7F, which is SCTPA, nope. TMA. 7E first. Oh, 7E, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, um, so uh, board members, the one thing we do at the end of the year, uh, every year, uh, is to select a slate of officers for the coming year. And uh, this year we have our chair who is termed out, unfortunately, and uh, a couple of other changes that are happening to our board. So we're gonna have a pretty different board next year. Uh, I'm sure you all are aware, uh, with a lot of new members coming in, including from Seminole and Oldsmar and uh, St. Pete Beach. Uh, but the first task uh, that we have is to um, advance a slate of officers and have the board vote on that. The nominating committee did meet uh, a few weeks back in October and uh, recommended a slate for you. Uh, the nominating committee consisted of uh, Chair um, Kennedy and uh, Bonnie Noble and Cliff Mers, and uh, met for about an hour and discussed pros and cons of, of everybody who was eligible, and then also uh, we're gonna ask you to follow up on some of the committee appointments as well. Uh, in your packet, you have information on who's currently in those roles, who's eligible to serve in those roles, and the committee uh, ended up recommending Commissioner Janet Long as chair, Vice Mayor Michael Smith as vice chair, uh, Mayor Bajowski continuing as secretary, and Councilmember David Albritton, who has an excused absence today, uh, to serve as treasurer in a continuing role. And I'm happy to answer any questions or have any of the nominating committee members uh, answer any questions if you'd like. Does anyone on the nominating committee want to say anything? We're all good. Any they, questions from the board? They discussed our shortcomings, so I'd like to hear <laughs> that. <laughs> In great detail. You should have heard what I said. Oh, I don't want to hear my thank you. <laughs> all <laughs> pro, <laughs> uh, Well, with that, then I guess I'm looking for a motion. Move approval. Is there a second? <coughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Madam Thank Chair, you. for the yes. record, there were no citizens looking to be heard on that Thank item. You. And also I got Council Member Gabbard as the first and Council Member Noble as the second. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good luck to the new board. Yeah, good luck. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> All good. All good. No, I'm not nice. Good I'm luck on the sinking ship. Right? Look at they're so defensive in here, really. <laughs> that's what you have when you have a nominating committee on the day after an election. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Okay, okay, item 7F, uh, I'm gonna give this to the executive director. Okay, so uh, we have a few important boards and committees that we are uh, participating in. I won't go into great detail, but the uh, three of them are the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group, which is comprised of Pasco, Pinellas, and Hillsboro, MPO representatives who generally meet quarterly to coordinate and set priorities at the regional level. Uh, the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance, which meets a couple of times a year, uh, we, we may step that up uh, in the coming year or two, but the Suncoast is a broader region that includes Citrus, Hernando, Polk, and Sarasota Manatee, as well as the core MPOs. And they also carry out um, sort of a super regional level of, of coordination and priority setting. The third group is the Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council that meets four times a year, typically in Orlando, although we have met around the state and that involves all 27 um, MPOs in the state of Florida, both at a staff director's level and uh, at a uh, governing board level. And there are a couple of advisory committees to that group as well. And that's a really great forum for sharing best practices, data, uh, insights, uh, the perspective of the Federal Highway Administration and the Florida Department of Transportation so that we're all hearing information at the same time uh, and from the same people. Uh, for, it's good for consistency. So we are looking to um, advance uh, several appointments to that, and I want to spend just a minute uh, talking about the importance in the coming year, and we'll have this discussion in greater depth um, soon after um, December, uh, but we are going to be discussing the possibility of 
developing a regional metropolitan planning organization for the Tampa Bay area. This is a topic that has come back um, periodically every few years since about 1990. Uh, and the governor back in 1990 uh, wrote a letter to all the MPOs saying, um, you need to merge unless you can sufficiently demonstrate that you have differences and enough um, uh, of, a, of a rationale why you shouldn't be one MPO serving the urbanized area. And that is typical around the country, is that every urbanized area has a single <laughs> MPO. Uh, these MPOs in Florida were generally set up in the 1970s at the beginning of growth management uh, at the state level, and that had a very strong county focus on transportation and transportation concurrency, and so that's the reason that we have county-based MPOs. Uh, we don't really have the same growth management framework that we did uh, at, that, at that time. So um, there are some pros and cons to a regional MPO, and we're going to definitely step into that discussion carefully and deliberatively and uh, certainly want to acknowledge that we have a unique situation here with the Pinellas Planning Council and, for, and MPO aligned as Ford Pinellas. And that's not a similar framework that we can expect necessarily in Pasco and Hillsboro. So that's just an example of the complexity. The, these discussions <coughs> will probably begin and end uh, at the TMA leadership group. And what I mean by end is that's going to be the group that's going to be ultimately developing a recommendation for the MPOs and the county commissions <coughs> to consider. Uh, so I think these are going to be very important um, committees. So having said all that, uh, the um, nominating committee is recommending that uh, Commissioner Dave Eggers, Commissioner Janet Long, and Councilmember Gina Driscoll serve on the TMA leadership group, Transportation Management Area, and that Councilmember Gina Driscoll serve as the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance uh, member. And it's nice to have one person from those two groups because typically the meetings are back to back. Um, and then for the MPOAC, uh, Commissioner Eggers is again recommended to continue serving that role, uh, but it's also good to have some backups and alternates. So <coughs> Vice Mayor Smith and Councilmember Richie Floyd have been recommended as first and second alternates. I do want to remind everybody that for the TMA uh, group, where we have the three, we passed a resolution several years ago and changed our bylaws that any one of our board members can substitute for somebody on that TMA leadership group because we had a couple of instances, uh, I think Commissioner Long probably remembers, where we didn't have all of our appointed members show up, but we had other members of our board show up and they were told they couldn't vote. And I never want to say that to you ever again. So uh, all board members can now show up and vote. Yes, that so, was a very good thing that happened. That's right. Um, so um, anyway, that's this, the recommended slate and I'm open to any questions or the nominated committee can take any questions as well. Sure. Okay. Gene, I have served on this this thing for the last year. It's been great. They are starting a new conversation in December, and I'm thinking that if you get not appointed, you might want to go do that instead of having me be there, because they're starting a whole new, brand new conversation on these MPO things that you might want to consider. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Yeah. <clears throat> And there'll be some new members from Hillsborough County now, we know that. Right, too. right. So it'd be better for everybody to have the conversation at the beginning rather than come into the middle of it. Anyone else? Okay. We need a motion. Yes. Do you need to ask if there's anyone in the audience, Tina? That would like no, to speak? There's no one in the audience okay. that wishes to speak on this item. It's a hot topic. Okay. Uh, looking for a motion. Move approval. Second. Or second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, we'll move on to 7G, which is the Ford Pinellas legislative priorities. Uh, thank you very much. I'll take this one as well. Uh, Linda and I uh, handled the legislative committee that met uh, earlier today. We had three members uh, because Councilmember Albritton could not be there. And just a reminder that when we have new members in January. We will invite other uh, members of the board to join the legislative committee. Uh, the committee met uh, to discuss a number of items, but most significantly, uh, you have in front of you as a handout an updated version of the legislative priorities. The committee reviewed these. I think they liked them in general. 
uh, but the committee was not yet ready to fully embrace uh, Mayor um, Will, uh, uh, Will's proposal for a preemption bill that uh, he shopped around last month. Uh, that bill is, is in your board packet uh, or in the legislative committee packet, okay, but it, um, Reddington Beach. Oh, oh. And it was a preemption bill that would have allowed local governments within a one year period to opt out if they held a local referendum luck with that. for that preemption. And, um, you know, Commissioner Eggers, I think, raised some good points of concern about that. If you've got 24 cities and you, six of them hold referendums to opt out, but not the other 18, it kind of looks like a hodgepodge. Um, that's probably a question you would get from the legislature. So I think we want to wait and see if there's a sponsor, if this bill has any kind of legs before we put it foremost in, in our legislative priorities. But that was really the only change. Uh, we picked up a similar change in the legislative platform, which is attached. I do want to point out that the priorities is a single page document wrapped in three neat little topics. There's a little bit of bullet points that allows us to be flexible within those topics. The platform is a longer document and we're not handing this out to anybody, but it gives us the ability to say the board has approved the platform as well as the priorities. And if bills come up during the session that we either want to support or oppose, this gives us the ability to do that. Uh, the legislative committee recommended approval so that we can uh, begin coordinating with our uh, various partners around the county and begin having meetings with our legislative delegation as they organize uh, following um, the organizational session uh, that's set to begin in a couple of weeks. So I have a quick yes, ma'am. Question, comment, or I don't know what it is. Whatever you'd like. Well, thank you, ma'am. That's a pretty dangerous thing yeah, to it is. say. <laughs> Really I'm going to be quick, though. I, you know, it occurs to me that when life hands you lemons is an opportunity to make some lemonade. And with the demise of T. Barda, I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of the various transit and transportation uh, heads and um, agencies. And it appears at first blush that the Forward Pinellas organization is the perfect vehicle to pick up that ball and move some of those issues forward. And I know you said we were going to have a conversation about it, with, but don't you think it would be wise if we looked at, I see Ming Gao there, he's wondering what I'm, he, you know, I've heard several times over the last month or two about the extraordinary powers that T. Barda has. And as long as I've been on T. Barda, there's never been an effort to access those powers, talk about those powers, or otherwise figure out if some of them could potentially be a vehicle or an avenue for us to make a difference in this 50 year plus um, effort to have a public transportation system. And so I just crossed my arms because I was mimicking Ming Gao over there. But I, I do think it's a worthy conversation to have so that we're all equally informed as we move forward to figure out what the next chapter is for the Tampa Bay region. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Absolutely. allowing me to say that. No, that's fine. And I think that's a great point to this. Um, we have not put it in the legislative priorities because we don't want to see legislative action from Tallahassee on this. I think the best course of action is for us to advance it locally and work with our DOT partners, including our great partner, Ming Gao, to figure out what are the benefits of putting together a regional MPO and how does that translate into additional uh, dollars? How does that translate into additional state support? Uh, what, is it, what does that mean to us if we take that big step? Because it's kind of scary to change, no. and, uh, but, it, but I think it's an opportunity, absolutely. Uh, but I don't want the legislature to be the vehicle for that to happen, and I don't think they can be legally right now. It would be again, somewhat wise, in my opinion, for us to have a conversation before they all start 
trucking on up to Tallahassee because I have been told by people a lot smarter and more connected than I am that there will be legislation coming forth that's going to propel this conversation I'm talking about with some financial incentives wrapped around it. So I would think we would want to be at least, you know, ready at the bit to prepare to respond to that because we had a, and I'm not speaking out of turn because he said it in a public meeting, we had a member of our board who is going from being a city council person to a state legislator who already informed us that he would be taking legislative action to do away with T-BARDA. And whenever that happens, <clears throat> it creates a void and someone's going to come up with a lot of mischief to create. We will Just certainly saying. monitor that. Um, there is a conversation that will happen on December 9th with the TMA leadership group. Um, and that will be looking at the mechanism and process and legal requirements for merging MPOs. And I think that'll be a good platform for us to determine if we want to um, have some sort of legislative ask or legislative discussion. So I would certainly encourage you to attend that meeting on, on December 9th at, on at TBRPC. Yes. All right. 9.30 a.m. Does anyone else have any comments before I ask Tina if there's anyone in the audience? Tina? No, Madam Chair, there's not. Okay, we, we have to take action. Is there a motion? To approve the legislative priorities recommended oh. by the legislative committee. Move approval. Thank Second. You. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. What do you want to do your director's report? I sure do. We're just rolling right along now. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, just in terms of um, the spotlight update, um, nothing major to report right now. I did want to let everyone know that um, we have uh, continued to work with uh, our FTOT partners on US-19 construction projects. And um, uh, I just provided Commissioner Eggers with a very detailed summary for a, a talk you're giving uh, next week, I believe, on what's happening with US-19. And it just struck me that there is really a lot going on in the corridor, both from a design standpoint and from a construction standpoint. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, and gotten emails regarding the proposed pedestrian underpass, or not proposed, it's designed and about to go under construction at uh, just south of Republic Drive. We had a discussion about that at the Legislative Committee. I won't go into detail here now, but I did want to let you know that there's been a lot of um, misleading information and uh, inaccurate information uh, that's been spread about that underpass. It is essentially adding a little more than $1 million to the total cost of a $242 million capacity project. And it is one underpass. There's also one overpass. And there's also one shared access uh, with cars, pedestrians, and bicyclists at Boy Scout uh, Road where that's happening. Uh, overall, it is adding an interchange at Curlew Road. Interchanges are incredibly expensive, and we're excited to see that project move forward because it's been long overdue, and it's been deferred by two years already, and deferring it any longer would be um, uh, contrary to the best interests of the citizens of Pinellas County, and probably Pasco County as well. Um, so I wanted to update you about that. I also wanted to let you know that we had a productive discussion with the Florida Department of Transportation a couple of weeks ago about the future interchanges on US-19 north of um, Curlew and Tampa Road, which we all agree should be interchanges. Um, but at Alderman, Klosterman, and Tarpon Avenue, and even Alt-19, there's been more debate about the feasibility of interchanges and the cost of those interchanges. The department has um, done an evaluation that we've requested. It was a good evaluation. We're thankful for that. We still have some questions. And so as we work to resolve those questions, we've got at least shared data and shared information we can work together to resolve. And I think we'll get there. Essentially, the department is telling us that Alderman and Klosterman probably need to be interchanges as well, but that there is a possibility for Tarpon Avenue and Alt-19 to be at grade, um, maybe innovative intersections that don't need to have that expense and um, disruption of a full interchange. Um, so we will continue to flesh out those areas of, of, of questions. 
And then probably in the spring, we will have a workshop with this board focused on that issue because it's a big, meaty topic. And then we will go out to the business community and have a discussion with them. But uh, I think that's coming soon, and I think it's coming along, and we're satisfied now with the progress that's being made about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the sidewalk improvements for Gulf Boulevard. I gave you a heads up that it was a big, scary number. Uh, we did sit down with the town of Indian Shores a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they are still committed to the plan that they picked, uh, but they are going to work with their residents and with the department to um, eliminate the right-of-way cost, which is almost $30 million, uh, by working with the property owners to get uh, voluntary easements. The town thinks that's possible, and the department has committed to using an existing consultant contract to help the town better identify where those right-of-way needs will be most important to get. Um, I'm not optimistic, but um, I'm certainly willing to let the process go forward, and we'll see where we can uh, go with that. We did agree in that group that there would be a fallback plan that would eliminate the right-of-way requirement by reducing the width of the sidewalk. Um, so you would have a five-foot sidewalk with a shared lane for bicycles and cars. Um, speed's 30, 30 miles an hour out there, so we would need to maintain that lower speed. It's not an ideal solution, but you only have 40 feet of right-of-way, so it's a really tough segment. But that would make the cost dramatically lower. So we have some options going forward. We're continuing to work with the town. There is a meeting tomorrow with the town council. It's a workshop that I'm going to attend along with FDOT staff. It may be postponed or, or canceled because of the uh, storm, uh, but progress is moving along. Last thing I wanted to mention is the Alt-19 Investment Corridor Plan. If you haven't paid attention to the community workshops and opportunity to comment, uh, I would encourage you to do so. We, we had light turnout at the physical meetings, but we've had online opportunities for people to comment, and that's been a little more robust. There have been surveys that are out, and we do have a plan to go out and individually meet with the uh, neighborhood groups and community association groups along the corridor. The ones in St. Petersburg are particularly active around the Tyrone area, and so I think we'll have robust discussions about redevelopment and transportation in that corridor. Uh, so far, people have been very happy with the work the consultant is doing, and I think we're making good progress. Um, we will share the results of the community outreach for phase one with you um, when we're ready, probably sometime uh, early in 2023. Just wanted to give you an update on that. I think our staff's doing a great job, and it's always hard to get people to show up at a meeting, so we need to go out to where those meetings are, where people are already gathering, and that's the next step that we're going to take. And all that's uh, online on the website for Advantage Alt-19. Are there any questions about any of those items for me? Yes, sir. Yeah, just a comment. You mentioned interchanges and as a, as obviously a way to keep traffic moving and get traffic into, uh, onto the roads. And I just, I, I don't think that can be overestimated or overstated enough. I just think that's an, a really important piece of uh, how we improve our road system without necessarily adding lanes. Um, I know I've been traveling up East Lake Road quite a bit, and um, you know there's a discussion about uh, lane increases there. But when you go up there, whether it's interchange uh, cha improvements that are needed, or technology, or using the technology that we have, I, I, I've just never seen. And I keep challenging staff about the timing of, of lights and. During the day, it's different. You know, it's like it, it can't. You can't use the same timing right. throughout the day. It just it just doesn't make any sense. And you have road. You know, the crossroads, and you know, there's still there's nobody going any longer. And the, meanwhile, you look in your rearview mirror, and it's way back down East Lake Road. And it's just we got to think of better ways. And I know I know I know uh, our county staff is really working on that technology piece of it, but. Also, these interchanges are just so critically important. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we FDOT folks creatively come up with. So uh, it'll be good stuff for North, North County. So you thank have you. Uh, reminded me that in our adopted long-range plan, we set aside a certain amount of funding over time to invest in technology and look at technology applications. You're absolutely right. Um, we have not gotten uh, any applications for our funding for technology that I'm aware of. But we are doing some small pilot projects on safety using technology, and I think those have been pretty effective. So we will continue to do that. 
Uh, I think the Alt-19 corridor, US-19, Eastlake, are all really good candidates uh, for different types of technology that uses, I guess, what we have out there and makes uh, the most efficient use of the investments that we're making or have already made. So uh, stay tuned for that. And I, I, I think we ought to continue that discussion for sure. I think that's it. Uh, just a reminder for the meeting, December 14th. Is that correct? I don't want to get the wrong date. I've got one other thing i got to do before you do that. Okay. I forgot. So I did want to just, and I'm putting finger marks on all this, but I wanted to hold up this nice little award that came to Commissioner Karen Seal from the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations. She was not able to travel to Minneapolis, but Chelsea Favreau of our staff was there and accepted the award on Commissioner Sales' behalf. We will make sure she gets this. This thing's heavy. Um, but it really awesome. is a, a great acknowledgement. We sent out a, a press release not long ago, and uh, um, it's gotten a lot of traction on social media. And again, it's just a real testament to, uh, I said it earlier, for Mike Reardon, our citizen. He has not been at it as long as Karen Seal. Um, but it takes determination to advance transportation projects because, you know, uh, Rob just presented, or we just presented the new um, uh, uh, fall TIP. We're talking about five years down the road before we get a project even in the funding program, typically. And, uh, and then you're only get, getting design, then you've got to get right of way, then you've got to get construction. So being able to accomplish as much as she has done over 20 years is an amazing feat. It is. This took us seven years to get this thing done. Absolutely. Right. So um, this is a huge award, and I was really happy to find out that one of my good friends was the number two uh, candidate, uh, the mayor of Henderson, Nevada, who I served with on, on the American Planning Association. So good people out there. Yeah, that's in the Las Vegas area. Uh, quickly, just a reminder, December 14th, here at 1 o'clock, we'll feed you. Um, and if any of your co other commissioners, they need to respond to the invite if they want to come to it. And you know, I just read this. It says, um, Bonnie Noble and me and Cliff, there'll be a formal recognition. Does that mean we have to have a new outfit? Does Cliff have to have a new suit? <laughs> 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 Always. What kind of outfit? I'm just kidding. Okay, and you know what? It will be Christmas time, so if you want to wear something Christmassy, it'd be nice. <laughs> just saying. So anyway, look forward. I think it's going to be an awesome day, and I look forward to seeing you all then. And I just want to say we did invite all 24 mayors, and yes. we've gotten a lot of acceptance from the mayor. Yes. So, um, and Mayor Hibbard and uh, Mayor Brown from Largo uh, and it are going to give remarks at the meeting, along with Mayor Johnson of St. Pete Beach. Yes who will be joining our board in January. Uh, Mayor Welch may send some remarks, but he's gonna be out of town and is, won't be able to join us. Hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, Motion adjourned. Okay, bye-bye.